and welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you leadership lessons, knowledge and experience and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. And today we're going to have a conversation with Penny Wong. Uh, Penny, you're very much a role model uh, in your industry. Uh, welcome to the program. Thanks, Fritz. Thanks yeah. for having me. And uh, allow me to introduce you to the audience. And I'm just going to give the, the highlights because so much to cover. Uh, you have a long background in IT and telco, um, and specifically in the cybersecurity space. And um, on your bio on LinkedIn, it says preparing for the AI singularity. That's definitely something uh, we're going to cover. Uh, you set up Just Ask Penny. You're based out of uh, Sydney, uh, went to the Uni uh, of Sydney, but also the Future Directors Institute. So this keeps some ambition out there, uh, which I'd like to explore. And for the audience, uh, we met in Borneo uh, in 2013 at the WCIT conference, where we both uh, presented. And uh, no, I'm glad uh, we're able to uh, continue our conversation we had done. Absolutely. So, Thanks, Penny, let, let's begin with that. Uh, what, what when I go to your LinkedIn page, uh, preparing for the AI singularity, we're going to deep dive in the topic. Uh, why is it in there? Why is it in there? Yes. Um, I I've come from five backgrounds: um, cybersecurity, telecommunications, payments, AI, and everything to do with blockchain, um, Web three, and I'm bringing everything together. Mm. Uh, the, the crazy conversation that I used to have around AI and robots has somehow now become relevant, which is quite interesting since I guess chat GPT dropped last year. I was one of the happiest people alive because now I can stop educating. People can try try things on their own and then come to me. Yeah. Um, now why sees uh, the, the topic there is CISO uh, preparing for the AI singularity because I come from a risk uh, viewpoint perspective of how things break. Um, and how to secure things, I can see a future where AI can completely get out of control. Now, with that in mind, um, before AI, I guess the future of AI, it starts to under, understand map uh, because our world is built on map. Uh, it would probably start to break encryption before it does good, <laughs> which is my viewpoint of we need a new ways of securing systems, technologies um, that is probably not built on what we know today, SSL, uh, because when that breaks and it's going to be game okay. for everyone. Oh, yeah. but for the for the uneducated SSL, what the, what, what what does that mean? Um, it's it's a security layer uh, on your internet transactions. So okay. the little padlock that you see in your web browser, okay, that is a secure connection. Uh, to the entity that you're actually um, engaging in, whether it's your bank or your government, uh, to secure that that transmission of data across. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I see things from a, a risk-based perspective, where I would generally go into the organization, assess their threat landscape, and then understand what methods or methodologies they could put in um, or tools to secure the environments. Uh, now, with the rise of AI, this is going to be really challenging. No one ever thought we will have to secure data in motion. Mm -hmm. We're now converting with systems. I mean, everyone now calls it AI. Um, they are intelligent to a point, but they will get intelligent to a point that it surpasses human intelligence. Now, that's where it, the singularity, um, coin, the term is coined, where it, it will go so far ahead that it's smarter than us and it we're not going to be able to turn it back. Um, my call out has always been, let's build on new secure infrastructure, which is what people are now calling Web3, uh, which comprises of a number of things. You know, blockchain is an underlying technology, various different payment systems, but it will affect every part of society and every industry. How we do trade finance, how we decentralize science and so forth and so forth. So I'm not going to get into that there because I can go down five rabbit holes. Um, but that's where the tagline um, CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, preparing for the singularity. So I'd like to be in a position where I can help prepare for these um, potential vulnerabilities and exploits, uh, which could be driven by AI um, or bad actors utilizing AI for bad. Okay. Um, 
you're painting a bit of a gloomy big, uh, future, but we'll cover <laughs> that later. But I was just wondering, I um, mean, you demonstrate so much passion, passion for technology, for digital technology. Where does this passion come from? How did it start? Oh, do you really want to go down this path? <laughs> um, well, my father loves science fiction. So okay. when I was three, he used to put me in front of Star Trek. Um, and it was a great baby sitting tool for him. Um, and I loved it ever since. So my love for science fiction and science and technology was born out of watching pretty much all the Star Trek seasons. And a fascination that one day I'd love to bring data for, from Star Trek to life. Um, and also Kit from Knight Rider, which is another another show that they had in the late 80s. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that, that, that also explains your background you have at the moment? My Oh, yes. Yeah. So this this is actually um, Kylo Ren's ship, <laughs> not Star Trek. So I yeah. switched between Star Trek and Star Wars, yeah. depending on uh, the talks that I have. But generally, the security talks, I have this background, and this took me through the pandemic, to be honest. Okay. I mean, I have to... Make it fun for everyone as well. <laughs> okay, so uh, I mean, what you're now describing is the fact that your father put you in front of Star Trek when you were three, uh, got you into this whole uh, cybersecurity space and everything around it. Uh, yeah. Just out of curiosity, suppose he would have put you uh, in front of another TV show. Do you think you'd still end up here, or uh, or not? Um, it's environmental. Um, I guess it would have been a slower pro process. Um, the information that Star Trek puts forward from philosophy to science to, you know, um, you know, looking at our humanity as well or as species, yeah. uh, that played a huge role in my life. Um, also, my dad's an engineer. I have two older brothers, one's in electrical, the other's in mechanics, and I've ended up on the software side. Um, so that helped as well. Um, they always encourage me to explore things. I mean, my mum probably was tearing her hair out, but I took everything apart from remote yeah. control cars. Uh, my brother and I killed the TV, which was a cathode ray tube back then. Yeah. We still blame each other. Um, I took my own car apart when I was 18. So that, I guess, environment of, um, some would call it risk-taking, <laughs> um, experimentation, uh, but not being yelled at as well, because I always had one or two screws left over. I'm like, okay, well, you know, does it work? It was more of an encouraging environment that I, I, I grew up in, fortunately. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, was your mother encouraging this or was she felt lonely with all these geeks around, uh, the, uh, these people uh, curious, <laughs> breaking down things? I think I think um, uh, my mom was probably at a wit's end because the garage was full of all engineering things. Um, at one stage, she freaked out because I wanted to become a mechanic. Um, and I don't think she was too happy. <laughs> it was a very uh, boy boyish environment. I settled on uh, software um, development, which she was okay with. Um, but uh, I think she, she's used to it. She she has a very she's got a great sense of humor, so okay. I think that worked. <laughs> um, and, and, well, good to know. Um, but when when you um, hear your mother say, "Look, that should not be a career for you." Um, uh, that doesn't sound like, um, um, let's say, it's a, it's a very conservative mindset. Oh, that's not for girls. Yeah. So what's your take that, on Yeah, my dad stepped in. <laughs> okay. So my, my dad used to be the, uh, the, the <clears throat> diagnosis who would say, uh, let me explore, let me do things, let me try. Um, he always encouraged that. But the one thing he always said was, um, this will actually both of them agree this is your life we're not going to tell you what to do we're going to give you as much guidance as possible which is what we think but your generation is different yeah. like i was already playing, like they gave me a computer they you know sacrificed a lot of the income for it because they knew it was the the next generation thing and they didn't understand it but if i understood it i'll create my own path so they supported that um okay. So that that for me, um, I guess, uh, was was a huge um, difference to how other children uh, were brought up. Um, I have friends that the parents said you can only be a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant. Oh, they hate their jobs. And I had I've got one close friend. She became a lawyer, but it's not her. She's a creative. She's just a lighthearted person. So she. Um, uh, secretly had another job in a creative role for six months instead of being a lawyer <laughs> but she loves what she does now 
Okay, but um, uh, well, come back, coming back to you. Uh, I mean, it just oozes out of everything, uh, everything from uh, from you that you love talking about and thinking about uh, the impact of digital technology. So you started off uh, to going to school, to university, to study this. Um, mm -hmm. How did you start your career? What was the first step? What was the first step? Um, when I was at uni, I was working full time as well. Um, and my first job was in retail, but retail in terms of the um, the admin, um, some of the retail stuff. But but then I started to play with the computers. And I didn't know back then, as I was looking at the inventory and, you know, printing all the tickets, I just I was just looking through the modules. I'm like, oh, this is quite interesting. And I said to the boss at the time, you know, you've got an accounting package here. And I think I don't know why you're using MYOB and you're using this inventory system. Um, you can probably do it all together and save time. So they said, can you do it? I said, yeah, sure. I can try. I can test yeah. it. Um, but I didn't know the impact. One lady got paid, let's say, a very nice amount to do accounting and, and payroll. Another lady got paid a nice amount of money to do um, inventory. And here's me, still in uni. Um, working part-time slash full-time because I was still at uni saying, oh, I can do all this. I can all make this all be easier for you guys. Um, when I proved that I could do it, they were so impressed. They said, do you want a full-time job? Uh, well, only if I can do uni as well. Sure, why not? So then they fired the other two ladies. I did not know. I, I Yeah, that was my first job and first experience. In hindsight, um, had I no known more about impacts and um, tra this is digital transformation now coming in because that was a very huge lesson for me. Still young, um, I'm automating things, great, great, great. But you always need to now consider the impact that it'll have to the rest of the workforce. Again, yeah. at 19, at 19, you don't understand this stuff, right? You're still too young. Um, I didn't know that until later, like months later. I'm like, oh, what happened to the two ladies? <laughs> or to my surprise and horror, I thought, Oh my God! Had I known, I would not. I would would not have automated. I, I would have, you know, somehow worked out how to involve them still. Uh, is um, that true? Because you've you've made a career out of uh, yeah. turnaround jobs, digital transformation, and with all yeah. these uh, turnaround jobs, uh, you see there's going to be, um, in most cases, yeah. people losing a job. There's going to be impact on the organization, on people. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Eventually, that one experience at 19 didn't stop you from still pursuing that career in changing um, organizations. Actually, but, it reminded me. Yeah, yeah, it reminded me every single time on on how to help. Yeah, because when I do see transformation um, coming into play, I always do. Uh, I go, I go over and beyond to make sure people are either upskilled um, or are given another role in another department. Worst case scenario, I'm actually calling people up, finding them jobs. So I've placed so many jobs just out of the goodness of my heart because I'm like, I can see that job going. This is coming up and I'm already calling up, <laughs> calling up either recruiter friends or other friends. And I've placed people in jobs because, because I know they've got families and they, they need they need a job. Um, I've in throughout my career as well, given up two jobs for elderly people and I'll never say who they are. They'll never know but the hiring manager and myself will know those two different roles because I know it's hard as you get older to stay in these roles. Um, that's also another thing leaders need to be cognizant of when you do look at bringing in technology and AI and, and, um, and automating things. Um, as long as people have good intentions, there's a role for everyone. So whether you can upskill them, include them somewhere else, um, you know, open up an opportunity elsewhere, uh, you need to remember the the people side of things as well. Yeah, not just it's not all just about business. Yeah. Okay. Now you've uh, in your career so far you've uh, taken on a, a number of these very large turnaround uh, jobs for organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. How conscious or how well thought do you think these organizations are when they ask you, okay, can you help with this turnaround? Is it because everybody else is do it uh, doing it, or is there a real vision which uh, then uh, means you have to do a digital turnaround. Well, okay, when I do the turnaround, it means something's fallen over. Yeah, okay. 
Um, very rarely do I get a nice greenfield, which I'd love, a greenfield project where I get a blank space, blank canvas and I set things properly and um, the the jobs that always have paid wills also um, have been the wheels are falling off, it's um, a product that needs to be commercialized in enterprise space, uh, conflict between the technology vendor, the teams, requirements, all sorts, yeah. Um, so with that, um, I, I I generally see a lot a, a lot of things that have gone wrong. Why why it's not working? Yeah, and why it's not working generally, it's not the, the technology, it's the people. <laughs> um, I've always come from an engineering side of things to yeah. build systems, to integrate to large large um, uh, environments, um, or to create products. But what fails a lot of the times is people's uh, expectations on how technology will be rolled out mm -hmm. because technology only forms 20 to 30 percent of the actual solution everything else change management policies law um you know the governance around it as well is huge and a lot of that uh is overlooked a lot of the times oh his blockchain oh his ai now make something of it where i'm like stop don't do that I mean, if you do do that in six months time, call me because I can guarantee you the wheels have probably fallen off. Um, and this is where I guess when I do speak to governments um, and uh, and uh, leaders who are embarking on that journey, uh, why are you doing it? You know, what problems are you looking to solve, solve or what opportunities are you looking to open up uh, before you just throw the technology in? Because that's an enabler. It's not always the first thing to solve every problem. Yeah. And, that, and, and and the why you do something also triggers me. It's a nice segue to a question I have. So how do you find success? Um, what's, your, what's your definition of success? And also on the projects, how do you have a discussion with organizations when it's going to be successfully completed? Is that because the technology works or is it something else? It's generally the whole program. So success could, could mean the product launches in market and it doesn't <clears throat> fall over so with that there, there's a lot of testing involved there's a lot of um you know stage gating things as well um a lot of the times two areas will stop a project it's always security from infosec teams or legal so at the beginning of each project i normally engage those two areas so i've oh. i've come up with a, a secret source a recipe I, I would say of how i do things um when i walk into an environment the first two areas I look for is someone in legal who's possibly going to be across the project you can't find yeah. someone mm -hmm. um, and in infosec as well because that's risk at the end of the day uh, and the reason why a project doesn't get pushed forward is because of risks you know risks that would probably end up in the boardroom so you need to mitigate those risks early on uh, it would would ensure the success of a project uh, success also means to me that every party walks away with a level of satisfaction that um, they also got something out of it that's positive. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's uh, stake, uh, basically stakeholder management. It is stakeholder management. Okay. Um, you know, I'd like to I'd like to negotiate win win situations between supply and client, regardless okay. of which side of the I'm at. Uh, it's about doing business in a in a fair manner. Um, what is fair? Uh, and when we talk about partnerships, it's not a supplier. The, the partnership is they're in for the risk and the reward together. So it's building relationships or rebuilding relationships. Yeah. Okay. Now, what you just mentioned about the first, the very first job when you were nineteen, which got two people fired. Uh, along this uh, definition of success, was that successful or not? No, I would say no. If okay. I could do it again, if I, 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 I've always think about this. If I could do it again, I would have made sure those two ladies, um, a had something to go to. If not, then I would have made sure that they, they are still involved somehow. And okay. I probably would have not, this is this is probably a tricky question. I probably would not have automated everything at once. Yeah. yeah I would have staged it out. So this is this is now me protecting people as well. I would have staged it out. So then they had time to to um also evolve. And then I would have stepped out altogether. So okay. that I would have done it that way, which is why I I don't I, I prefer projects where I come in, fix things, and then I hand it back. Okay. A, I'm not, uh, you know, would that also mean 
would that also mean that if an organization would come up to you say, can you help with our turnaround? And you see that management uh, has this urge to make this very hard approach regardless of staff, would you then walk away and say, that's not for me? Or uh, so, or are you kind of trying to convince them to do it differently? I would probably try and convince them to do differently. Um, I, you know, as a management consultant, <laughs> bringing all my, all my skills into play, um, there's always opportunity that can be created out of anything through a crisis, through a bad situation. I mean, you can do clever things like, okay, you've got a, a whole divisional team. Let's contact a recruitment company. They can start placing these people ahead of time. And then we can look at a full transition. So there's many ways to actually approach this without, um, I guess, causing casualties along the way. Um, I understand business is business, but there is a way to do business but also make sure people are looked after. Got that. You've just got to think a little bit more logically, a little bit more, you know, yeah. Okay. Now, in to what extent was this a milestone in your life? And what are the big milestones out there? Which, hey, that, that these for me were turning points, which actually uh, got me to the next phase of my life. Um, <laughs> I think the robot was a turning point. When I met Sophia the first time, that was a huge turning point. Okay. For the people who um, did not, uh, do not know <laughs> who Sophia is, what is Sophia? Sophia, uh, Sophia the robot uh, has been developed by Hanson Robotics. And I met her back in 2017 off the back of a conference in Singapore that I helped my friend run. Mm -hmm. And then I wandered off into the next, uh, I guess, section of, of the event. And I came across the robot. And I saw her, heard of, heard of her on TV, um, but I've never seen a full humanoid robot, like live in front of me. And I went to their stand, Singularity Net. I looked at her and I was just like in awe because this is exactly what I've been watching on TV in science fiction. This is exactly like data from Star Trek, except it's female. So what blurted out of my mouth <laughs> probably caught the attention of the team. And I said, huh. I think I'm going to build my own boyfriend. <laughs> it was just, it was just a, the moment thing. And um, I, I think it, it probably was Simone. I'm not sure. One of the guys just cracked up laughing. Uh, then I had a, you know, a conversation with the team, got to know them, the rest is history. And I, you know, I guess uh, I've been following them ever since. Um, and the amazing community that, uh, you know, are attracted to everything that they're doing as well in that community. Yeah. Okay. Um... So, so far, you've been inspired by Star Trek. You've been inspired by Sophia the Robot. Is that yes. the real source of your inspiration or are there other sources of inspiration which uh, make you do what you yes. want? Yes. Um, Nikola Tesla mm -hmm. and um, uh, um, Leonardo da Vinci, um, who are multidisciplinary, uh, I guess, folk. Uh, if I can be a percentage as smart as they, uh, I would be. I'll be ecstatic. I would love to actually bring them back to life so I can converse with them. Okay. So I've had this conversation with a few of my industry <laughs> industry colleagues. Let's grab all these texts and inventions and, you know, out of a uh, conversational AI and a robot, maybe you can talk, talk to these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, again, uh, preparing for this talk, I, um, if I look at, uh, you could say what you're talking about. You you also have a view on the vision on the future. You talk about how the world's going to look like in uh, 2050. Mm -hmm. And maybe sh briefly share the answer with you. Are you optimistic about what technology is going to bring us? What the future is going to bring us? I'm always optimistic optimistic about the future. It's what you make of it. Um, I'm yeah. a, an eternally positive person. I can make lemonade out of lemons. I <laughs> mean, any situation. Um, and I hope that other people uh, have that view as well. You can turn something bad into something good. I mean, if with that intention, I believe things could be very positive. If more people, uh, I guess, thought that way, are more proactive. When it comes to the technology side of things, um, there's you know the term that people throw around called Web three, which involves the next stage of the internet. Um, you know, we've gone from yeah. what used to be called the web one internet web two now web one being you know we we're able to click on links and that replaced like encyclopedia uh, and if you had access to the internet you could access knowledge which is fantastic um, web two for good or for bad it gave us the smartphone um, social media 
you know, again, good or bad, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, with it, because we were building so fast, um, it attracted a lot of uh, flaws, vulnerabilities and systems, which is why we have so many cybersecurity issues today. Um, before we fast track to uh, building AI, uh, my call out has always been, look at what's being built in Web3, which is a decentralized web. Um, it, uh, I guess, uh, it is being formed in the view that it'll be a little bit more secure than the web one, web two version. If we build on the new, uh, you know, there's 20 different aspects, depending if you're if you're a technologist, if you're you know, a change maker, you have different viewpoints on what this technology will bring. When you're talking about decentralizing technologies, it means, I guess, access for all of humanity. Um, science, for instance, is really important. If we didn't have the Human Genome Project, we wouldn't have fast track all the COVID um, uh, solutions. Now imagine diseases, uh, you know, where scientists get together to solve the diseases, coming up with vaccines and so forth, um, or even climate change problems on the decentralized web, like bringing people together, regardless of race, religion, color, geography. That for me as an underlying, I guess, um, enabler uh, would be a positive future for all of us, for all of humanity. Uh, it means that we live on this one planet. How do we effectively coordinate all our resources? Because there is enough for everyone in terms of food, energy, um, everything. Yeah. So okay. I see a positive side as long as more people get involved in you know these things. Yeah. And the conversation just um, uh, you know uh, is is promoted in a positive manner. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh... Maybe the last question for you. Um, the young people out there listening to this conversation, what would your advice be to them? How could they get involved? There should be, um, yeah. What's your advice? Yeah. Um, I've always said, I'm not better than anyone. I was just better at Google. So yeah. my ability to uh, use technology to access information yeah. um, now with the rise of LLMs and um, Bard and ChatGPT is just taking that to a whole different level. If you've got access to the internet, your education is virtually free, whether you can afford it or not. So it's there's no excuse. If you can't afford university, there's no excuse that you can't afford that you can't access the um the content to learn. So learning is essentially free, um, and it could be five years old or six years old. It it doesn't matter. Um, it shouldn't stop you. So everyone should be responsible for their own education. That's that's my my you know. Educate yourself. Yeah, okay. Educate yourself. And, educate. and then maybe uh, once you're educated, how do you then apply the education? Any thoughts on that? Um, just try talk to people. I mean, there's eight billion of us in this world, and when I talk to girls in STEM, I've always said. Just because one person says you can't do it, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you can't do it with that one person. There's 8 billion other people in this world. So just keep asking. Um, find your tribe. You know, Find people that resonate with what you're about, um, what your passions are. And with that, you form your own community. Um, you link communities. You learn. You learn from each other. And you never stop learning. Don't, don't stop. You're not a tree. <laughs> keep moving. Keep moving forward, hopefully. <laughs> But um, yeah, just keep moving, keep learning, um, keep exploring. I think that's what life is about. You've got to have fun yeah. along the way as well. Yeah. Good advice, Penny. Uh, hey, Penny, well, thank you so much for sharing uh, your time with the brand called you and sharing your insights in uh, what you're doing with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fritz. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the brand called you videocast and podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.